Here's a good rule of thumb when it comes to strength training. If you're doing low reps, bump your sets. And if you're doing higher reps, drop your sets. That's right, the total volume goes up when your reps go up and your total volume goes down when the reps go down. It's not just about the sets, it's also about the reps. If you do this right, you won't overtrain and you'll hit the right amount of volume. Otherwise, overtraining or undertraining is probable. I think you have to simplify that a bit more, right? Like what's going on? Uh, first of all, I think people have to understand uh, what is volume, right? Yep. So Let's set, start with that. Sets times reps times weight gives you total volume. That'll volume. give you total volume. Okay. That's right. Um, and then, so, and I think that's probably the best. Here's the thing too. It's not perfect. No, it's not. No. And, and nor is almost anything we do, right? Tracking macros is not perfect, right? Uh but like tracking macros, that in itself, I think, is such a good starting position for yes. people. Like if you've never tracked volume just to get an idea of like, how much am I am I lifting totally on my body a week? Uh, I think it's a really good place to start. And it mainly just like you would with somebody who's tracking macros, just to bring awareness. I'm not telling you to increase sets, decrease sets, change anything. Just, just track so you can get an idea of kind of where you're currently at. And then you could start to apply some of the advice that you hear us talk about on the show all the time where we talk about, well, you know, based off of stress and sleep and lower your volume, hear us, lower, reduce your volume, reduce your intensity. And if you actually have a decent baseline and you've at least measured that, you know, a few times in your training career and have an idea of, oh, I'm, I'm at a higher volume in my training career right now. Maybe this is, and then you mm -hmm. start to notice like bad night's sleep or other stresses. It's like, oh, I, I should probably reduce it. Otherwise, you hear us say these things like reduce volume, bring back intensity, and it probably seems really vague and over over generalizing like what we're like basic training. Yeah, well, I, this was a mistake I often made um, in my early years that in which I counted sets as volume. I don't look mm -hmm. at weight and I don't look at reps. Mm -hmm. It was just total sets. So if I did ten sets in a workout, then it didn't matter if the reps were low, didn't matter if the reps were high, didn't matter if the weight was. It was just about intensity and then total sets. But um, but really, higher reps, by the way, this is all within reason, right? Because you could go crazy with this. You could do 100 reps, and then the volume would go through the roof. Uh, but we're talking within reason, you know, strength training reps, right? So typically up to 20 low reps can be as low as one. Um, when you drop the reps, it just doesn't cause as much damage in the body. This is why when you see powerlifters train, they do so many sets of uh, of an exercise or within a workout. Powerlifters do a lot of sets. A lot of sets. Yeah. Olympic lifters too. They'll do lots and lots of sets, but they're doing one, two, or three reps. You do a set of 20 reps in the squat, it's way more volume than if you did a set of three. Mm -hmm. And I think we know this instinctively. Um, so calculating it like this uh, really helps. Otherwise, what ends up happening is, what tends to happen with people, is they'll go from a low rep phase to a high rep phase. They'll keep the sets the same and then be like, why am I so burnt out? Yeah, why am I getting destroyed? Why am I getting so <laughs> sore and hammered? Uh, it's like your total volume actually went through the roof if you use the formula that you talk about. Right. And it's a good thing to, to, to look at because it's hard to otherwise calculate. Uh, otherwise, it's based off of feel, which is fine mm -hmm. if you're really experienced. But a lot of people can misread that. They tend to be like, no, I have to do this many sets. I have to do this many exercises. So if you do it this way, you're looking at it. Wow, I did, you know, if my total volume was whatever number, 10,000 then I can stay within that or slowly increase my volume over time to apply the overload principle. But a lot of people don't count well, yeah. the reps. Yeah, it's kind of parallel to uh, starting out with like counting your macros or counting your calories and having a good idea of like the structure of that. Same thing with your workouts. And that's why it's good to have a plan, actual written out plan uh, going into training, which a lot of people don't even consider that. Like they'll go in and they'll hit kind of a routine that they're used to doing and maybe increase weight. And that's like their only metric that they really uh, gauge uh, versus, you know, coming in, having a plan with that. So, you know, kind of where you're at volume wise, and you, you apply all that uh, um, uh, formula in there and then you can adjust it. Uh, and figure out what that feels like too. You pay attention to how that feels, so then you know you're not dependent on that going forward. Totally. I mean, complete transparency. I didn't uh, ever do this until I got into competing. Yeah. I, and uh, I, I, I mean, my excuse would be, I guess I didn't care enough. You know, I guess uh, it wasn't that important to me until it was. Right. Until I had to like show 
improvement and people were going to be judging me based off of that. I guess in the past, I just kind of, you know, willy nilly and said, oh, you know, I'll adjust this and scale this up or down. Or I would just like you count yeah. sets like, yeah. oh, right now I'm doing three sets. Next That's month. That's got to be the majority of people because I was the same way. Yeah. And so I just never, uh, I never cared enough to do that. Now, now you know, looking back, I wish I would have mm -hmm. done that because I recognize what a what a difference maker was again. Just becoming aware, just becoming aware of where here I am starting this journey of I got to show up on a date uh, and present the best version of myself, and then I'm going to go do it again, and I got to show improvement from that previous day. Boy, I better make sure that I'm tracking and and actually going about this mathematically. And so that was what started me on tracking, and uh, it, you know, again, it, it made me just very become very aware of what I kind of was naturally doing. And what would happen is, you know, over the course of a month, um, you know, you have these weeks that you might string together where you have great momentum, sleep is good, you're in a good mood, pre-workouts hitting, and you're like killing it. And then you have other weeks where you're not. And then like when I would, when I would zoom out, I would go, oh shit, I'm not even like progress. I'm not even progressively overloading. What's happening is I have this like good week and then I have like a down week and then a good week and then a down week. And then when, and in my head, I'm thinking I'm progressive overloading and, I, and I'm stretching my capacity, but really what's happening, I'm just kind of ebb and flowing. And so I just started to go, okay, I'm going to just, here's my baseline and I'm going to hold the line or slightly increase over time. And just doing that created this like, I mean, just continual progress and I'm like, shit, I wish I would have hacked into this sooner because just becoming aware of it and making that little of adjustment of saying, hey, I'm going to just hold the line and not go backwards on my my volume, hold it, and then just slowly, incrementally inch it up. I was seeing this incredible progress it's, over those it's three years. Follows, the behavior follows very similar to what happens with people with uh, calories and macros. Mm -hmm. When they don't track and they go, no, no, I, I, I cut my calories. Yeah. I really did. Mm -hmm. And I'm eating less. And then you look at their, you actually have them track and you go, well, yeah, Monday through Friday you did, but then Saturday and Sunday you had days that were much higher. And if we average it out over the week, you actually weren't in a calorie deficit at all because Saturday and Sunday are so high. Yeah. Happens like this with, with volume. When you're not tracking necessarily, you're not really paying attention. That's exactly what happens. People are like, no, I am adding more. I am doing more, Yes. but they're not counting the weight. They're not counting the reps necessarily. They're just looking at sets. Then when they do the math, they go, oh. It actually, it's, I'm staying the same. Nothing's changed. No wonder my body's not progressing. And just like the way I communicate macros to someone, my goal for a client is not to teach you to do this. You are weighing and measuring and tracking food for the rest of your life. It's so that you have a better uh, awareness around what you do. That's and, and you think you know, and, to, and then you track, and then you realize, oh, God, I didn't really know exactly what I was doing. And once you have done that for a little while, you get a much better understanding. And the same thing goes for this volume. Like, so I know we've probably mentioned it before the show, and people are like, I'm not going to do that. That just seems like too much work, or it's like, that's overkill, or I don't need to do that. There's all these other things I can do. Or, like you said, I'm fine. I know I do that. And so, really, this is more about, like, Let's figure out your baseline. Let's just become aware of it. And then, you know, just from that alone, I think you're going to see huge benefits. And so I wish I would have tapped into that a lot sooner, you know? No, totally. All right. So I got to, do you, do you guys ever watch that movie a long time ago? It was with um, Bruce Willis where he kind of like discovers like he's benching and he keeps adding weight to the bar and he got in a train yeah. wreck and he survived. Uh -huh. and what was Shattered? That Shattered. No. No. Or no. Unbreakable. Unbreakable. Yeah. Unbreakable. And then what was the bad guy? The bad guy was like Mr. Mr. Glass. Glass. Yeah. Yeah. So I was that's a nickname for you, Adam, because you <laughs> 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 got hurt again, bro. Over Ultimate the weekend. Fragile villain. Every time. You get hurt. <laughs> I will say though, I gotta say this. No shit talking now. Okay. The pictures you sent were rad. Oh, yeah. You get yeah. at least you yeah at least you went. I mean it was style. a cool story. At, at least he was doing something cool this time. <laughs> yeah, it was it was just bowling. jumping yeah, off yeah, your yeah. truck. Yeah, and, yeah. And I will, yeah, give me that. It wasn't jumping out of the truck. It wasn't bowling. Yeah. You you know, know, sneeze. At least, yeah, at least yeah. I was throwing some big air <laughs> while I was doing it. Right, no. the shower. So tell oh. me what happened. So you went wake. Is that wakeboarding that you did? Yeah, yeah, we went wakeboarding. Yeah. And first, and I mean, I didn't. I mean, you're really good. You're actually a lot better than because <laughs> you said you did it all the time. Yeah, off I mean, the pictures. I mean, you're you're going uh, pretty good. So I was actually. So what I was really excited about was um, I'm 30 pounds lighter riding than I have in a very long time. And so there's this like, uh, so I've been wakeboarding since I was a kid, right? So I, I picked up wakeboarding when I was in eighth grade. So that's a long time, right? So um, about the same time I've been in snowboarding, I, I played both, I did both sports around the same time. And uh, I would say I, I got better at wakeboarding than I was a snowboarder uh, back then. 
But I, I mean, most of what I would consider my good years of riding, I was about 180 pounds. Mm. And so, yeah, I could still ride, like even as a big meathead and stuff like that. But you ain't getting hairy. Yeah, it's you, awkward, you, dude. yeah, you <laughs> yeah. move different in the end. Let me tell you, feels. like, uh, now, especially speaking from the, this experience that I just currently had, is uh, whoa, what a difference being 30 pounds felt. I mean, mm-hmm. I, that was the just the first run that I I had sent over to you guys, and I'm like, as soon as I got up and I was riding, I'm like. Oh, this is why I was having such a hard time because I'd rid- I I always go every summer and ride at least a couple times. Where do you guys go, by the way? Uh, Lake Tolick. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. it's it's uh, near where I used to live. Uh, it's actually the closest lake to here, the Bay Area, with houses still on it. So you can actually okay. buy a house on the water, just like Tahoe. Okay. Not a lot of lakes do that, and that's one yeah. of the lakes that you could still do that. Um, but boy, I, I, as soon as I got up, I could feel. I could just feel it. I could feel the way uh, the way I was resisting the water in the boat, and so like the boat it didn't cause the boat. Like when you're two thirty and you cut, you lag the boat. Bro, yeah. I was pulling yeah. the boat. I know. I was and, like, yeah, okay. And that'll that'll just throw, as like an yeah. acre. Yeah. yeah, dude. I I can't like. So I was just surfing, and I, I literally every time I would pull the turn, the boat would be like. <laughs> yeah, and when you do that, okay, so that that throws the wake off. Uh, and then when you jump, it throws off your sure. balance. So it makes such a huge difference. So anyways, I, I was actually, I knew going into this, like I'm going to be 30 pounds lighter and I haven't got to ride in a while. So there's a part, and my son's not the age where he's like paying attention to what dad's doing. So like deep down inside, like, uh, yeah. you know, you inter- gave me, him a show, yeah, inner me awesome. was like, Watch you know, Super dad. yeah, yeah. Dad's going to go, 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 go out. Right. And the guy that owns the boat, like I know I can ride better, which that's also cool too. Right. They've just had their, they've yeah. had their boat for like six years and I know I can still ride better. So I was all excited, right? Deep down. I'm not sharing this with anybody. Uh, <laughs> now I'm sharing with the world, right? So yeah. embarrassing. So I'm all excited and I'm like, I'm not fucking around. I'm gonna do my mobility. I'm getting down to the down to the dock early. I'm gonna get down, do oh, all you my got serious. Bro, I could do all my mobility drills, everything, right? <laughs> oh no. So I'm down, but what I do is all my hip and ankle stuff. I'm like 90 90s, pigeons, combat. That like makes I'm do, sense. Yeah, doing sure. deep deep yeah. squats. Or yeah, I'm th- I'm all worried about my lower body. Don't even pay no attention to my upper body. Don't even <laughs> it doesn't even cross my mind. Because if ever I ever got hurt riding, it was always a lower knee, body, a hip, yeah, lower yeah, body, yeah. lower body yeah. stuff, yeah, sure. right? And that's how it happened. So I uh, I landed. It, it, it first happened on the, this. I hit a, a pretty good jump, right? And I cleared the wake. And as I came down, I my arm hooked in the water, and it just ripped it back. I can't even demo it because it's so it's, I'm so hurt right I now. I see the bruise. And so it goes So it goes like this, right? So the other arm, the, the, other, the left arm, it, go, it, it goes screaming out. And it goes, oh, and I feel it strain. And I'm like, ah, I'm okay, right? So I get in the boat. I'm like, I'm okay. I'll do it right again. And, I'm, and I go back out again, knowing that it's already a little bad. And uh, it's in this time, it my my front of my board after a jump dips in, and when that happens, I mean that's that's pulling you. <laughs> yeah. And I was resisting it, trying to to trying to get myself out, and that yank on it, it just strained. And it's like me going down while also holding yeah. holding it, and it just I heard the pop. Oh, everything, and I went, oh! But God. it's not a tear. So I don't think it's a tear because if it was if it was completely torn, it would have bruised a lot worse than what it did. And it would actually, I think it would feel better because it would be severed where it just feels like it's a really bad either strain or partial you might tear. might have tore pec minor and not realize it. So I don't know. It's pretty bad though because I'm on day two now. I and, see the discoloration. And, and it, bro, it, it hurts like, it hurts like a mother. I, I've to- so. I tore pec minor on my left years ago and you can see it just a little bit. Years yeah. ago, so, partial tear. I mean, you could definitely. It's so inflamed still that I can't tell what's that going sucks, going dude. on completely. But yeah, bro, you know, so man, it's uh, it's a real, real tough thing to. You know what I think bothers me too is because what we do. It's like so frustrating because I sit here on a podcast and I talk to people all day long about this type of stuff, and I know what to do. And it here was a situation where. I was like, I know better. I need to do these things. And I just neglected my upper body because it wasn't crossing my mind. The only way to get ready for explosive, um, unpredictable movements is to practice at lower intensities, explosive, unpredictable. I mean, you can't be ready for that. It is hard. It is one of the harder things to be ready. Because like at least in like a... Like basketball, I could take it moderately. That's for a what I'm bit. saying. Like when you're you're at the mercy of how the boat is pulling, yeah, you, yeah. right. And a a freak, 
flying a lot out of physics and, uh, against now, you out there. Granted, in a perfect world, what I could have done or what I should do is like I should go out on the lake four or five times exactly. and, and no jumping and yeah, just, just yeah. cruising, cruise, yeah. getting used to the tension and yeah. the pulling. Yeah. But come on, but that's like, right. yeah, that's come on. <laughs> I don't get that. I ain't got that kind of time. You know what I'm saying? I don't got four. I come out there once or twice a yeah. year, and so yeah, so it was a. It was a bummer, but I mean, at least I got a run in before. That was a good run. Okay, so so, so this is so this is why you texted me the other night about how to use the BPC one five seven. Yes, yes, and all that. Okay. Yeah, so I, I sent a message to you because I I thought there was something else besides the BPC one five seven because I took that. And by the way, I tell you what, uh, and I've said this before already uh, of all the peptides that we've we've messed with when we've done. That one is one. It's yeah. ir it works eerily well, especially yes. the injectable. I remember yeah. when I tore when I tore my Achilles and I used that. It was it's weird. Yeah, it was almost scary. How and that, they call it the Wolverine peptide, right? Yeah. Is that what it's called, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. So it's just and it, it did instantly. Like I felt the next day, I already felt improvement from what I did before. And I'm like, that is wild. It accelerates dude. healing by a significant percentage. If you look at the animal studies on it, it's remarkable how fast. So BPC-157, thymus and beta is the other one that I told Which you. Which I didn't know I had until this morning. Well, you do have it. Yeah. So <laughs> thymus and beta, BPC, both work synergistically. And then there's another peptide that, um, in fact, uh, we got an email from our partners at MP Hormones because it's, it's on sale. It's 25% off uh, in a stack with uh, something else. But it's called IGF-1 uh, LR3. So IGF-1 is the anabolic hormone, insulin-like growth factor that goes up when you're Growth hormone goes up. So the reason why athletes will take growth hormone really is to get their IGF-1 to go up because it, it boosts uh, mu you know, muscle growth, fat loss, healing, recovery. So if you were to add anything else, it would be the IGF-1. Okay. Yeah, and you can also site inject that as well. So you can also put that directly. There's a systemic effect, but you can also inject it directly into the- Now, what about the thymus and beta? Does that matter? Thymus and beta is amazing. So thymus and beta will be more for muscle- tissue okay. yeah bpc is but i everything. mean as far as injecting straight into no, does no, it matter no. systemic yes more okay. systemic okay the bpc then, is more like connective tissue collagen and then you recommended to me that i do a a split on the bpc that's right so i should do twice like, a day twice a day yeah twice a day okay. instead of one big uh, one big one okay. uh, although this is like speculation people will say it works better that way but that's the that stack right there you want to talk about healing quickly so I did the BPC and thymus and beta just general. And I noticed, I told you guys, I noticed like these really kind of wild recovery effects from workouts. It just wasn't getting sore. It seemed to have this kind of anabolic effect. Well, anyway, since then we got messages from people who use them both for injury and they're like, it's eerie. Like you use it yeah, yeah. and then you're like, wait, am I actually better? Because I don't have the pain like I thought I would. Mm -hmm. Should I go back to work? That was the message. The messages we were getting were, I feel like I'm fully healed, but it's only been I mean, if, a few days. Should I go back to working out? It's like proceed with caution. If I if I had to guess, it's probably the number one peptide that like athletes are using. They have to of oh, yeah. all the peptides oh, yeah. and all the things that it, they all do. Yes, the BPC one at five seven has to be the number one yes. that they're using. I mean, just yeah. I mean, it kind of gives you if, what it makes me feel like. And we've said this before. I've talked about this for a long time. My buddies and I would be always like, it's so crazy to watch pro athletes. And their healing process, like we yeah. don't get to see the behind the scenes stuff. All we see is like, oh, he's out six weeks with a torn ACL yeah, yeah, or something yeah, yeah. like six weeks. <laughs> you know, how is he back from something crazy? Uh, and that's exaggeration. But you see these crazy yep. injuries that the average person is off for six months a year, and they're back in they weeks. Get back sometimes. to like explosive movements, yes, so quick, so yeah. fast. I mean, they're they're, they're doing everything. Real. They're yeah. doing everything, right? They have the peptides. They yeah. they have the diet. The Red sleep. light, probably too. They have yeah, yeah. correctional exercise. Yeah. They don't have sports. This is their yeah. job? Physios that are so I'm managing I'm, all that. So yeah. I'm doing it right now. So I've got I've, I'm taking the thymus and beta now because I didn't realize I had it this, until this morning. So I'm taking that. I'm taking the BPC one five seven and I'm red lighting right now. Yep. So that's and then I'm of course I'm doing. But the but cold. the pec doesn't look shorter. It doesn't look. Uh, so it's hard to tell. If it's so inflamed right here. Oh, yeah. it, it feels though like I did. So I'm almost certain it's a. A partial tear for sure, a bad sprain. I mean, I don't know how many like tears and injuries you guys have had, but when I tore my MCL, ACL, and my uh, um, uh, my Achilles, it was less in hurt or it hurt less than all the sprains that I've had. Yeah, yeah. 
And so this hurts like that. It hurts. It hurts yeah. worse than my torn muscles have been in the past. And so that makes me feel. Can actually, you still like fl flex your pack to see if it's working? Okay. Yeah. 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 I, right. I, yeah, yeah. So yeah, I, it feels a full tear. Yeah. Be, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that hurts to do that, yeah. but I I can do it right. And and I can still I can move. I mean, it's just really uncomfortable, and th there's like a lot of pain when I get up to that point. So, and then now it's starting to cause shoulder stuff. Now my shoulders all, but that's all because I'm did I ever tell you compensating. Guys, did I ever you know? tell you guys about the nastiest muscle tear I ever saw in the gym? Did I ever tell you guys about the guy who tore his quad? Oh, Ooh, that would look God. weird. Did you see it happen or was it like- We dude, heard it, it To aftermath. tear a quad has got to be Ooh, so- We heard, pull that off the bone is we insane. Heard, we heard it. And we heard the guy scream, went over to the leg press, oh my God. pulled it up. It was Why thankfully, is it always a leg press? Uh, thankfully, a leg press has safeties. Yeah. So he was pinned underneath it, but it didn't crush him, right? Yeah. So we all rack it up, and he had shorts on. And so when we did that, his leg straightened, and he was a big dude. And it was like femur quad. So his quad came up into his hip. Uh -huh. And you could see the skin. Like yeah, dude, the skin was stretched. <laughs> Bro, tore right off the that, gravel. That is crazy. Tore, patella uh. was over here on the side. Like from leg pressing? Yeah. That's so weird. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah nasty, that's so nasty. I think part of the quad was attached. I don't know. I just, I still have it <laughs> <laughs> burned in my yeah, belly. Like <laughs> oh. Look, if you love the show, and I know you do, go to mindpumpfree.com. We have a guide. The secret to building a great butt you got to go check it out. It's free. It costs nothing. Every time something like this happens to me, right, which seems to be more frequent than not lately, uh, it's like this is like, I don't know, this is definitely reshaping kind of like where I'm at in my fitness career and in, in my life. Like uh, as much as I don't like being as small as I am right now, I also recognize how much healthier my body does these types of things. Yeah, dude. And so I'm like, you know what? I'm going to, I think I'm going to stay this like, you know, low 200, I'm 200 pounds right now, maybe even 199. I didn't weigh this morning, wow, but I'm in the high really? 190s to 200, which is, I haven't been this since before competing. Even when I hit stage wow. shredded at 3%, I was 203. Yeah. So, uh, but I can just doing things like that. I feel more at my mobility is so much better. I mean, other than this dumbass mistake I made, which is that was all self-inflicted. You know, if I had taken care of myself better going into it and not trying to show off, I'd be fine. But it's, again, reminding me, like, you know what? This is probably how I'm probably going to keep myself as I go deeper into my 40s and 50s because I think my body feels better at this that. This is why – this is the male ego. This is why we pay more for car insurance. Just, just, <laughs> we just, you know, we get excited and we do things that, you know, if you were to ask us, even in the moment, like, do you think it's a good idea to – no, I don't, but I'm going to do it anyway. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. yeah. You just pay the price. I mean, what I know it, it's what kind of sucks is that it's, uh, you know, the internet sucks, right? And so what we do – uh, it's, it's in my best interest to be jacked, right? Like, well, being, uh, competitor Adam is more appealing to YouTube and, oh, yeah. and social yeah. media yeah. being skinny, lean, healthy me is not, uh, you no. know what I'm saying? So it's there, th that also makes it, it's already, it's already challenging enough to battle my own personal ego and insecurities. Yep, yep. Feel like I've eclipsed that. But then I also have the other side which is the business aspect of like, Oh, it, it would behoove me to be this jacked dude, you know? Dude, it's so funny you brought up like self awareness too around that. You know, I just read this this study around happiness. I got to read it to you guys because it, it it was it was very interesting to read it. But then it also brought up some thoughts about what we think we know about happiness and what what we see in the data. So this this is Arthur Brooks stuff. Or no, else? no, this was a study. So the American Psychological Association found that when people thought about and judged their happiness. So when they went back and said, you know, how happy am I really? And really thought about it. They got less happy as a result of it. <laughs> yeah. So as a result of, thi so thinking too much about one's own level of happiness could be related to fears about not measuring up or not being as happy as other people. And that's what they found in the study. So, so thinking too much about the self is actually yeah. not a good thing, even though Western medicine that's interesting makes us focus so much on ourselves. That's, what makes you happy? What makes you what yeah. makes you tick? What you don't like? What you do like? Which also brought me to the data on spiritual practices and how effective they are for, or how good they are for happiness, or how anti anxiety, anti depression they are. And when you look at spiritual practices, generally they're other focused. Yeah. They're not self focused. Yeah, you're yeah. you're giving up that to God. You're yeah. you're that's, thinking that's about other people. Yeah. Think about how can I make other people yeah, happy? Yeah. What can well, I do you're for not other the people? Top of your totem pole. You're that's not right. The, yeah. So it's, it's it doesn't just fall upon you and in your shoulders every time. I know. I've I've actually wrestled with this personally too with um I was thinking about this because I was like on the serious like growth hack of like 
you know, I'm, I'm trying to figure out all my flaws and like, you know, like dive into it and, and expose it and then work on it and keep working on it. And I've been like so focused on working on that. And it's, it's like to a point now where I think it's a negative, like, yeah. it, it's like, I have to like, you know, now just be in the moment more and, and, uh, be more present and, and then not necessarily react, but like utilize what I've been working on as opposed to just like analyzing the shit out of all the time. Sure. Well, the data shows that when you're other focused, uh, not people pleasing, cause that's still self-focused. That's right. trying to keep yourself totally from being criticized, but other focus generally, how can I, and, and genuinely, how can I help others? How can I be of service to my family mm -hmm. or my spouse or my friends? Or how can I volunteer for something I believe in, you know, that, that's so, so strongly about or whatever? You do better. You're happier as a result. When they find people who are depressed, they tend to ruminate in their own thoughts about themselves and what's going wrong in their lives and how they're not like other people and what's wrong with myself and all that stuff. It makes you less happy, which is funny because again, Western medicine, what does it teach you? Think about you. What makes you happy? What it makes you tick? And it's totally. Is, are you getting what you want? Is it you know? Is your life the what life that you want? And so we just think about ourselves all the time and end up getting worse. Well, along those lines, I saw something just recently too on the. I don't know if you do you know the number, Doug, on uh, how many total thoughts we have in a day. I saw. How do they count, count that? that? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I don't know how they count that. I've heard fifty thousand. Thrown out there, yeah. I thought of I which eight. like ninety percent are the same. You had <laughs> well, so yeah, so that so the interesting stat. Day. Well, and what about re re regardless if it's there? eight thousand or fifty thousand, the point of why I'm bringing this up is less to do with the total amount, right? Because obviously there there could be a wide range of people, yeah. right? But the percentage of those that are negative yeah. is like eighty something percent. Oh wow, oh, we man. think X amount of time and like eighty percent, and then of that eighty percent. Like ninety percent of that is the same ones over and over. Uh, yeah, that you're having. I'm dumb. I'm dumb. I'm dumb. I can't. Wow. I'm not good at this. I'm wow. not good. At this. So not only do you have this percentage, whether it's eight thousand or fifty thousand, we have a, a ton of thoughts. Majority a day. is negative. Majority of it is negative, and a majority of those are the same ones, repetitive over and over. Not yeah. wild. Yeah, we're like crazy people. <laughs> well, I mean, and, but then you. That's your uh, no world, wonder. Dude. No wonder so many people have anxiety and depression. Yeah. Like, so that, because that's it's I all mean, self inflicted. Yeah. yeah. I well, often thought if we voiced what we were actually saying in our own heads out loud, we would be crazy according to other people. Yeah. Well, oh, this yeah. is why there's that oh, whole, um, there's a whole trick where you're thinking something negative about yourself. And then what you do is you say it out loud, but use your name instead of me or I'm. It tends to depersonalize it. And then you can look at it and go, oh, that's not. You yeah. know, like instead of saying I'm like you're analyzing somebody else. Yeah, like you did something. You're like, oh, I'm so dumb. You're like, oh, Sal's so dumb. And you hear it and you're like, oh, that doesn't sound <laughs> you know, very cool. But that's your world. Your thoughts are your world. Yep. So you're just thinking negative all the time. And now how do you how do you stop that? Well, you don't stop that by stopping that. You do something else. Yes. Because you can't stop that. Like yeah. right now, if I say don't think of zebras, <laughs> I know majority of people right now are thinking of a zebra. Yeah, oh, I thought an elephant. Yeah, yeah. so <laughs> okay, I'm sure you did. Yeah. That's but, why the 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 gratitude move is such a uh, such gratitude a huge, and is, other focus. Yeah, yeah, like what can I do of service yeah. to other people? Yeah. How can I help other people? And then uh, who is it? Bishop Barron called that spiritual physics. Mm. That you end up getting more the more you give. The more you yeah. give, the more you get back. That's yeah. Whereas, you know, people I don't tend remember to remember him saying that spiritual yeah. physics, yeah, yeah, yeah. spiritual yeah, physics, like you like empty your, what, the way he said it was you empty yourself of love, you give it to others and you fill up more. Yeah. That's yeah. He, yeah. He called it. I, I mean, I just that think cool. that's such a, like, yep. I, uh, I mean, I, I feel like I can, I try and do this and I don't think I ever can do it enough. Like it's one of those practices of being like, just being grateful of, of where you are, what you've done yeah. already. It's like we, we're, we get so, especially our culture. We get so caught up in the next thing and more and that person. Well, and it's so, just like, man. Social media is a big- Yes, uh, massive reflection. It's a big advertising platform. Not, I'm not talking about for advertisers. I'm talking about for people to advertise their own lives. Yeah. So you're scrolling through and you're looking at your friends and family that you never really talk to, but you're kind of in contact through fa Facebook. And it looks, even if you don't believe it 100%, it still permeates your- you look you're like, man, look how happy that person is. Look how great I that. Know. Look what they're doing. Look how fit they look. Look what's going. Without realizing it, you're making, you're, you're driving yourself further, further down, in terms of you know how good you're doing or whatever. It's well, I, I mean, and it. imagine how torturous that is for that the person Comparison who. Trap. I mean, I, I take a lot. I, I take a lot of pride in that. Um, I believe some of, some of, if not all of my best moments and best things are not on social media. 
mm-hmm. where that's a f- opposite for a lot of people. Yeah. A lot of people is a highlight reel of the best that it gets for them. And so it's this snapshot of like the most highlighted uh, moments or things that they have or have done where if the, and if that's the case and you half of it, you're pretending it is, yeah. it's like, boy, that will well, how sad is that? Cause you got to stop for that moment to capture it, you know, and, and then make sure that like the video is going and you're, you're losing that, uh, that feeling in that presence that you had. That, well, I, and that's what I mean by, I think my best moments and things were not captured because I, one of the, the things that I think have made uh, some of these moments in my life so is I'm hyper-present. The yeah. most hyper-present things I've done aren't getting captured on, on a phone. And so they're not being presented on a social media platform, but that's not true for everybody. A lot of yeah. people are so fixated on presenting uh-huh. uh, their best moments or things that other people might want that they even even when they are doing somewhat cool things in their life, they're so worried about presenting it, they're not even getting the full gratification of experiencing it. No, yeah. and that's a lot. No, you know, there's 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 studies on it's this. So recreated strong correlations between the amount of times you post and how lonely you are. Oh, there is. Yeah, oh, yeah. Wow. Like, and, and uh, there, the argument was always, well, which came first? Is it that you're lonely, and then you're posting more? Is the posting more making you lonely? Uh, and the data shows both. Interesting. The data shows that one feeds the other, and vice versa. Um, the the saddest ones to me to see, and I, I, I've been critical of these, but now I, I look at it with more empathy. The saddest ones to me are when people post very challenging moments, and the reason why I was so critical was because. Watching it, you're like, you actually stop to get your phone to record yourself crying yeah. over that thing and then post it. That seems so well, what's disingenuous. Sad about it, yeah, is you just don't have that intimate circle of friends That's or it. family that They're you would go to yeah. for moments like that. Right. Like you're projecting this because you're feedback is only through social media. Yes. And like that's that's your your sort of network that you have, which is that's that's depressing. Now to stay on this topic of this kind of self feeding loop, because we mentioned anxiety, you know, when you have anxiety, um, because this is closely related to depression, very, very closely related, you have the physiological uh, aspects of anxiety, which are like, you know, sweaty palms, fast heart rate, feeling fidgety, kind of restless. Then you have emotional anxiety, which is, uh, which causes the physical anxiety, but vice versa. You can get physically anxious that can cause emotional anxiety because you're worried about how you feel. And then it kind of causes this, this, this feedback loop, uh, if you will. Um, is this the science that supports when you take like supplements that are like calming that are, yes. that, that's the, that's the yes. science that so, supports why this works. Yeah. So have you ever, um, so, uh, so I have family members with, uh, they'll get tachycardia sometimes just randomly their, their heart will just start beating quickly. And before they knew that it wasn't deadly, because then they went to the doctor, doctor caught it with a holter monitor. Is like, look, this is not deadly. Here's what you do. Here's how you can relax or whatever. But before they knew that, they would get this fast heart rate. Then because the heart rate's beating fast, they're worried it would cause more anxiety and make it worse sure. and worse and worse. Now, if it happens, as one person in particular I'm thinking about, they know what to do. There's a particular way they lay, they relax, they breathe, and it kind of goes down. It doesn't freak them out yeah. like it used to. So these herbs, so like skullcap, valerian, holy basil, passion flower, really, really good to cause the physical anxiety to go down. But you still got to work on the emotional anxiety. Right, right. So sometimes it's hard to because the physical anxiety is so, so present. So sometimes like take these herbs. And, and if you combine those, they're pretty effective. I mean, you're going to get a really nice sedative effect. In fact, before sleep, we'll probably put you to sleep mm. type of deal. But then you can work on the emotional anxiety. All right, why am I feeling? Why am I interpreting this as anxiety? Why am I feeling anxiety? What's it? Because the, the other part of it is uh, excitement and anxiety physiologically they're are almost the same. They're identical. Right. They're almost identical. Like falling in love. If they measured you, yeah, they they wouldn't be able to tell if you were in love, excited, mm. or anxious. Almost ready to die. It's all the same. <laughs> yeah, it's all the same. It's all the same. Like why? Response, you know, yeah, yeah, it's all how you kind of it's in, negative in, or interpret positive. it. Right, you know? right. So those herbal ones or even medicinals can stop the physiological aspect of it, but not the emotional. Can still. Yeah, you so still is go delivery with that typically in like in a tea that you would make with these herbs? You could, so, um, so you could buy them all separately, take them all, although I would take a lower dose of all because they're synergistic. Yeah. You could buy formulations that have them all. So Organifi has a sleep product that has all of those in the right doses. And you could take that as an enzeolytic. Oh, yeah. And yeah, and just, 
help calm the physiological aspect of the feeling of anxiety. Now, I imagine something like that because of the all, all the natural herbal stuff like that. I could even take that in the middle of the day. It's you like can. A, yeah, as I say, because it's more of a calming than it is like a sedative. Yes, yes. Right, Although right. Uh, in the in the combination that Organifi put it in, you take it before bed, go to sleep, take a half dose, I would do during the day because of the combination day. of all those. And those are all things that have been used, by the way, historically. <laughs> Um, for anxiety, like passion flower raises GABA, which is a, a inhibitory neurotransmitter, kind of calms the brain down. Mm -hmm. That by itself, passion flower by itself, is really nice uh, anxiolytic. You know, getting back to the what we were originally talking about this with this uh, social media and people, and like here's another <clears throat> interesting fact that I, I I read somewhere. I can't remember where I read this, but ninety uh, percent, either eighty or ninety percent of uh, all Tweets come from 10% of the people. Yeah, probably. That makes sense. <laughs> yeah. So think about that for a second. Like, that's crazy that, like, a very small percentage of people are, the, are 90% the, of everybody the Everybody else is observing? Yes. <laughs> you know yes. what's interesting or not about all. that? Yeah. Like, we, in, in, your, in our world, because we happen to have a, a platform we've built off of social media, so we're very much so intertwined into this yeah. nasty web. But, you know, it's it, obviously it's become a necessary evil to what we've built. But when you when you zoom out and you look at the whole world, it's only a small percentage of these people even using the these platforms and, and, and that are actually going on there and communicating with other people on there. Yeah. And so we we take this. I can't, and it's just a reminder to me. And I, I let myself get irritated with somebody online this weekend. And I'm like, I was reminded that's how that, that came up. I read that somewhere and I'm like, what am I doing? Like, this is one, this is one of the 10% idiots yeah. right now that are talking to me. Like I'm becoming one of those idiots by engaging, you, you know, know I get, I'm now part of the stat. If I <laughs> respond, <laughs> you know, what's <laughs> weird about that? What you just said right yeah, now yeah. is I bet that stat holds true in all social media platforms. Yes. Probably similar, right? Mm -hmm. Social media can does anybody doubt that that right now influences and shapes culture to an extent? Mm -hmm. Okay. Come on. So what we have is a small percentage of people yes. having a disproportionate influence yes. on culture on and society. Okay, so so you think, well, is that a good or bad thing? I don't know. What it's kind bad. of people? <laughs> a lot of it's engineered. What kind of people spend all day right. on a social media platform people commenting are, on other people's personal people stuff? Right. To, to cause yeah. what do you civil think? unrest. That's right. Who? What kind of person does this yeah. on a regular basis? People who tend to be a bit extreme, yeah. I would say. Oh, yeah. And so it tends to push and yeah. shift culture in a way to where, at the very least, if you're on here, your perception of what people's opinions are is going to be based well, off of this few small percentage. So you probably think people are angrier and more extreme than they really are. It's interesting because so I was listening to Jordan Peterson again on uh, Rogan, and they just uh, launched their Peterson Academy, and he was talking about like setting up kind of a, a network, social network system within people that were taking the course and all that. But it's like a paid wall, and so he's like, and uh, their whole thing is they. they you're not going to be able to be anonymous. You're not going to be able to come in there as, uh, you, you know, like a lot of the um, the negativity and, and things they found, it's just like because it's free, because it's like anybody could just kind of pop in. People can influence directly. They have motives to influence directly. It's like it's an interesting thought to think if you had it like – it, like all these uh, social networks out there, if they just decided to make it like exclusively paid, so you're all under sort of the same idea. I don't think that solves it. I don't. Yeah. Think, I mean, I I still remember what he said to us. That that still that that's one of the most profound things that someone I has think it, I think it, said to me about. It. I think it would yeah. it would limit it. It, it would, would help. I mean, in, in the know, academic I would, setting, I think that is a good option. Yeah, I think it's smart, but not in like the broad. Yeah, I think it's smart. I think it would help. But I still think, uh, you know, that it, you still are going to get that. I mean, look yeah. at our forum. Our forum oh, yeah, is an example yeah. of that. It's not all positive. No. Right? You definitely get people in there that, like, we've all been like, oh, my God, seriously, yeah. this is our community. Although, although did you this know? This is our community. True. And did yet, you know you can post anonymously point. now? Yes. That's what I mean. Like, so you have these things now. Like, so you're still going to get people that get behind a keyboard and uh, either one, uh, come from an anonymous uh, an anonymous post too. They're in a bad mood today, so they just feel like fucking somebody else's day up. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah. they're not in your face, so they're they're willing to say things that they wouldn't say. So it still has too many well, intangible knows, things that nobody knows what or knew. I think now we're starting to see. Nobody knew what the ramifications were of people 
being able to express an opinion without the potential uh, checks and balances of the real world. So what could you say in the real world uh, versus what you could say on social media and what are the potential checks and balances? In the real world, there's definitely things I wouldn't say because I'd be like, ooh, I'm probably going to get, I could get punched yeah. or someone's getting my face or well, consequences. angry yeah. people. Social media, yeah, you know, I don't care. You know, I don't, the people aren't, they don't know me. They're not yeah. going to see me. So it changes quite a bit. I mean, imagine how people would get treated. Imagine a nightclub where you you had men and women in there and men could say and do whatever and you'd never know who they were. Would any <laughs> woman enter that nightclub? Never. No, because yeah. you'd have enough creeps without the potential checks and balances of the real world yeah. doing some creepy ass shit. Yeah. Um, so that's just an example. Social media is uh, it, it's like that and it's shaping culture. And I think all the extremes that we see now, I think it could be placed squarely on human behavior in a, in a Petri dish without the normal checks and balances. I think that's what we're looking at. Yeah, I think so too. But I also think that uh, more and more conversations like this, like the thing, some of the things that we already shared today, like brings awareness around, like, I mean, I hope somebody else has the same thought that I have later on today, right? That they're about to comment to somebody who's an idiot yeah. and they go, wait a second, like, this, this is a very small percentage of, of the representation of how other people probably feel about me or whatever it is I'm doing. Me engaging them only makes me a part of that dumb 10%. I'm better off of, you know, don't pick up the brick. Dude, Leave it alone. Speak you know? of human behavior, yep. right? Because this is human behavior that we're talking about. I, there's a crazy study that I just read. I'm going to pull it up for you on UBI. Did you guys know they did a UBI study? Really? Uh, I'm, I'm, was, that, was that the one up in uh, Oakland? Oakland? Yeah, they did one. They did one in Texas. This, okay. this one was in Texas. So UBI is universal basic income. And so the thought, and the reason why they're doing this, this experiment is because they're like, okay, AI potentially could eliminate a tremendous amount of jobs. How are we going to, how is society going to handle this? Maybe we do something called the UBI where everybody gets a guaranteed income, no matter what, no matter what you get this guaranteed income, will that solve the issue? And then what about the, the, the fears that a lot of people have where they're like, well, if people just get paid, they're gonna be less productive. They're gonna do less. The argument on the other side is no, it's uh, you know, this is a human right. People should be able to take care of themselves. People will take that money and do good things. So this is debate, right? Well, so they did an experiment. And they actually took uh, a, a, they took 1100 randomized health households that were making under uh, $30,000 a year. So these are people who are not making a lot of money. And they took 1100 households and they gave each of them $1,000 a month for, for free yeah. for three years. And what they, so basically their income increased by 40%. Yep. Here's what they found. No change. Here's no what they change. found. <laughs> this Guaranteed. is what they, they found. Less. Yeah. UBI participants ended up earning $1,500 less per year, despite giving $12,000 more annually mm -hmm. for every dollar, $1 received the total household income dropped by at least 21 cents. UBI participants stayed unemployed for an extra month compared to those who were unemployed in the control group. UBI participants worked less and there were no substantive changes in quality of employment. They did little to improve their education or training to improve their income. They also self-reported increased rates of disability to limit the work that they can do. So in other words, Everybody who got the thousand dollars more a month did worse yeah. financially. It disincentivized. Not, surpri not surprised at all. What no. sucks is there's that one percent that would have. You know, yeah, so that person that, listening. There's that, that one. There's that, that one. You know, single mother with three I kids know. working yeah. two jobs already, and boy, that you hear leg a story like that that it was life changing. Oh yeah, that leg like, up oh. probably would just change her life, and yeah. it's like, man, that. No. But then there's the other ninety five percent that are just. So I so there's that that's there's always that argument, just, and I yeah. I feel very compassionate towards that. I know yeah. people like that. They've done studies on uh, charities that are local and they find them to be far more successful yeah. because, and this is what they think. And I agree with this when it's, when it's face to face and the people helping you know what yeah. you're doing with the money and they're involved, you're far less likely to, sure. to take advantage different of different level of accountability. Yeah, so this is just government. You just get a check. Yes. Nobody cares, nobody, yeah. whatever. Yeah. But if it's like my local, whatever church 
and you show up every Sunday and they see, hey, how's it going? We're giving yeah. that money. Or, right, is everything right, working right. out? And you show up in your new BMW. Yeah, and you're like, oh, you quit my <laughs> you job. You know what I'm Exactly. You're like, hey, man. You know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. What's going on here, dude? That's totally, I totally think that's yeah. true. Well, this I mean, is what's always hard about these ideas because it's like it starts out with like a noble, like, let's let's see if like we can help this situation. And then, But you have to like – you have to evaluate and analyze it whether or not it's effective and works. And That's then it. it's like you you either like keep it or you you scrap it. No, it based off of what happened. I don't I don't believe that either of you two think it's a noble cause ever. Do you? I mean, to you what? guys are like conspiracy kings over here. I don't think these things start I think it's a way to create oh. more government and more more ways for someone sure, else to line up. Predators their that that are get involved. I mean, do you? I mean, I'm an honest question. Imagine like, the control you, you have. Do you think that when this when a, a thing like UBI or a, like a system like that, right? You, so you're talking about the person that's creating it versus the yeah. person that's like buying into the idea. Of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. I'm buy- talking about the person that's buying into. Oh the yeah, idea yeah. yeah. No, sure, sure. Someone like that who's like donating money towards it or right. like that. You're like, oh, I think I'm helping out. But the person who actually created it. Totally. Uh, do you do you believe that they go into it with these like, let's really try and help this? This group of people no, out no. or do you think they see like listen we could build this system and what will happen is we'll they be, know we'll, exactly we'll click this much go. you'll go here we'll create a position for someone who has this That's another right. position will someone do this this person will make this much this person and it will and we'll be helping people out at the we'll same collect time five million dollars three million dollars system three million dollars goes to the bureaucracy of yeah. the people that manage and control it those are my friends we're all yeah. these high positions you know adam you're now the you know, the czar of UBI dispen- yeah. you know, dispensing and yes. Justin, now you're the whatever. It, you get a $500,000 a year salary. You get a two hundred fifty. It's the reverse funnel, dude. And then, just, and, just, and then they're like, plus we'll get votes because we're going to say that we're doing this and everyone's yes. going to want It's all about what money. you say and then, you yeah. know, it sounds good and you know exactly yeah. what's going to end up could, happening. You could sell this on both sides. Yeah. So I could sell this to conservatives even. I could even as a conservative say... Hey guys, uh, we're already cl- spending so much money on all these government programs. Let's eliminate them all, cut the cost by twenty five percent, just give people a check. So now we save money. So I could even sell it. Like oh, that. I mean, I think it. Right. I think it gets done on both sides. <laughs> yeah, I don't think that. The, I don't think conservatives are immune to this. No. I think they absolutely. I think it's just as nasty and corrupt on both sides. That's yeah. the reason why this is such an ugly fight between left and right is because there's something that the other the other side can always you can point see out blatant corruption. Yeah, on both sides. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, it's, it's blatant. Now. Didn't we just lose? Didn't the government just say that they accidentally sent? How much money was yeah, it? Two hundred thirty-five million dollars. Yeah, they just accidentally. It was. Ooh, it was. A, it was two an error. terrorists. Yeah, it was an error. But like, we messed up. Listen to me. You are going to get audited if you PayPal somebody more than what was it, sixty bucks? Yeah, yeah. And they just accidentally oh. sent two hundred million dollars to terrorists. <laughs> it, like, I can't even like fathom that. Like, uh, it, it doesn't even compute. And like that, people. Want to get all upset and rage about the most nonsensical bullshit? Yeah. That's like such a huge thing. Yeah. Was it like, really an accident? We're funding two hundred thirty-five million dollars of terrorism and like whatever else you have to say is irrelevant to me. Yeah, I mean, just, I, it was I mean, what's the, what's the it's total? Not the, 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 what's, the, the, the audit came back. So is the trillion dollars? Well, I mean, that they what, just what didn't is for? What's the what's the total now? The Pentagon's up to just the last five years. Oh. Oh I mean, God, uh, bro. I mean, every like, year it's been a couple trillions. This so shit what makes me so mad, dude. Like, ah. Sorry. You it's know, the just... real conversation around this is is if we if we were to move into a future where machines really did all of the labor and did everything, and then we all just got, you know, free stuff as a result what of do you it. Mean if we are going that well, way. Well, well, I don't know. Who knows what's gonna happen leading up to that, right? But let's just say that happens. Oh my god, we got all these these machines, they're super intelligent. They do all of our work for us, so now we're free to do whatever we want. Depression. I think that will be the worst ever. hell. I it think will. so many people will be so in such a terrible place yeah. because of that and not realize it. Right now, everybody's like, a lot of people think, I would love that. That'd be great. I don't think so. No, I think of a lot of people will be Why so Why do you upset, think so unhappy. many people, uh, uh, there's so many people that uh, really struggle when they retire because their whole yeah. life they were building towards this thing, yeah. this destination yeah. to get to. I mean, that's the book, The Alchemist, what that's all about. It's, I mean, the the... You know, and and I I don't know. I think that part of part of the hacks to being successful in life, it's not a certain dollar amount that you achieve. It's realizing that that the work is the is the best part. Yeah, is the struggle yeah. is the it's best my part. purpose. It's, it's why I'm here to do. I share that same story uh, over and over. On it's probably it's been a while since I brought on this podcast, but. I always talk about that time where Katrina said that to me. It was one of the most profound things, whether yeah. she intended it to be or not. Uh, and that made me really think when I was bitching on my way home from work because we just had a lot going on at the time. I was frustrated. And she goes, 
would you want it any other way? Yeah. Really? And I really had to think about that. Like, fuck, you're so right. Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. if it was so easy, I had no challenge. I was like, this would be boring. It'd be no fun. Like, and everybody thinks like, oh my God, that'd be so nice. Because yeah, when you're in the thick of it, a break and easy sounds That's so- That's what you want as a break. Yeah, yeah, you want a break and it sounds so easy. But I tell you what, give you easy for a year straight and tell yeah. me if you won't, you wouldn't be dying to go back to work and struggle again. That's yeah. what would happen. Yeah. That's yeah. what happens to people that retire all the time is they, they say, they say, they say, they say, they wait, they wait, they get to retirement, they mathematically figure it out, okay, this is what I can the live off to. Death rate spikes post-retirement. Yes, of that. and then they go, depression. okay, what do I, and then they, they get yeah. enough rounds of golf and fishing and then after Art, you've Arthur done Brooks <laughs> wrote a book about that. He said yeah. that, that there's a divergence of people after retirement there's like i don't remember what percentage was significant percentage get less happy and more depressed and more sick and it's, and then there's a percentage smaller percentage of people that do better the ones that mm -hmm. teach right they're the ones that teach right yeah. so yeah. it's like they switched from doing to teaching that was the key is yeah. that they became they, they went out and volunteered and taught um and then the other ones just like you know I, my dad struggled yeah. my dad retired early because so did my two best friends dad same thing and he was I remember, I don't know how many times he remodeled the house, he did the backyard, yeah. and I remember him losing his mind because since he was nine years old, he worked his ass off, and now because of disability, he couldn't work anymore, and he was, there was a period there where it was really challenging for him, and then what he, he, ended, he ended up, you know, joining a, 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 a biker club, and he made some friends, and he's got some other purpose now, you know, really involved with his grandkids, but there was like a, like a four year period, dude, where he was, it was not cool. Yeah, my man. dad just keeps making cabinets. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, another cabinet? I go, you know, and he's just showing up, and I'm like, that's great, you know, but uh, this has got to end soon, right? Like, I don't think there's any more space. This, this cabinet's the whole uh, cabinet. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna, you know what? I'm going to redo these cabinets. You know, so yeah, I want a cabinet in the cabinet. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah dude. That's a, a great, a great read. If you guys have not read it, I, I, I don't know if I've brought it up on here or not, was Die with Zero. That, that was a really uh, pivotal book for me in the last decade that I read. Yeah. Um, Somebody just recommended yeah, that to me. That. It's a good read. It's a really. Somebody just said you got to read that. It's book. a really good read. Uh, can we yeah, give that? Can actually, we make that the shout out? Yeah, Let's do that. I, We've I, already I, shouted it out. I think a I long probably, time ago. A yeah. long time ago. Yeah. Let's I mean, I would. I would. I definitely think you should read it for sure. Yeah. Where you're at. Um. I. So I. I. My. My journey with money was like this. Early twenties. Uh. As soon as I got a hold of any of it, um. I thought I was rich. And, you know, and also insecure about it. So I wanted to show off everything. So I was constantly buying for other people and buying things for myself. But really, it was, you know, for other people. Yeah. It wasn't really for myself. It wasn't making me happier. And I did a lot of that, right? Living a, a, a well above my means for the first, I don't know, 10 years of making really good money. And then I like, I, of the course, the big uh, 08 crash that was like a, that was like a come to Jesus for me and realized, oh shit, like I'm not really prepared for mm -hmm. a, a rough winter, you know? So then I went the other extreme where it was just like super tight with everything and saving and thinking retirement and that direction. And then, and that's kind of where I had been for a while. And then that book came and I, and it really kind of changed my mind about how I think about it. I mean, for example, I don't know if I've asked you guys this stat or not. You guys know the average age that somebody inherits uh, money from their family? Isn't it when they're retired? Yeah, 50 Six, or 60? 65. Yeah. <laughs> 65. Yeah. And you, you know like what percentage of those that was actually helpful? Yeah. Like hardly any, like yeah. 1%. At that point, you're fully done. I you've mean, either like, figured what? it yeah. out by then you or you've your already setup. accepted you're going to be broken. You don't care. Yeah. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Either, either one, you solved it and you got you got you you figured your life out because you're 65 already. Jesus, yeah. and you probably already had kids and they're grown. So when the inheritance comes, it really does nothing no. for them. And the average age that an inheritance would make an impact on someone's life is between 25 and 35. Yep, yep. So part of the message behind the book was like, listen, if you want to do something to truly help your kids and give them a leg up, your move is to probably plan that somewhere between 25 and 35. Otherwise, what, you're just going to leave them millions of dollars when they're 65? Yeah. Like, and hopefully if you did a good job as a parent, those kids kind of figured it out by then. And so what'd you just do? Let's, who's the author on that, by the way? Does anybody know? Uh, I'll look it up. I, I, yeah, see if Doug can get it before me because yeah, I have it. So let's I put know. that up there because literally- Bill I, I, Perkins. Who? Bill Perkins. All right, check that out. Bill yeah, Perkins. he has a cool- I think he's like a- like was a professional poker player. So he's got a cool story too. So he's already got a kind of a cool story. And the don't be discouraged or turned off by the title. The idea is not that you literally die with no money. That's obviously a catchy title yeah. to get your attention. Because mm -hmm. um, it's really not about that. It's really being a little more methodical though about- because everybody has like this- 
plan of like yeah. saving for retirement or saving for their kids, but they don't have like like a real thought process behind it. It's just like everything extra goes into investing yeah. and saving for kids. It's like okay, well, at this Are point, you're going to enjoy it and maximize. That's the other thing, and that was kind it. of where, where you seen me enjoying more of my money in the last like five years or so. Was like after I read this, I was like, you know what? That's like so true. Like. When I'm when I've done this left, I have all this set up for my son and my retirement, and then I'm like, and then then I'm not gonna care about this shit. The stuff that I'm interested in right now, maybe ten years from now, I'm not, I don't even care about it. But I really care about it now, and, and I feel like it's gonna give me joy and fulfillment now. So why am I delaying that, thinking that? Great point. You know, it's gonna be better at sixty. You know what I'm saying? It's, I, so I don't know. I, I thought it was a really good read, and if you haven't read it, I think it's worth a read for sure. Element is a company that makes electrolyte powders, no sugar, nor artificial sweeteners. With the right amount of sodium, it's true, most electrolyte powders are too low in sodium to even make a difference. Element T, not the case. A 1,000 milligrams per packet to fuel and power your workouts, fight sleepiness to help with things like headaches. It's great for low-carb diets, great for those of you that don't eat heavily processed foods and who work out. You need more sodium. Go check them out. Go to drinklmnt.com forward slash mindpump. And on that link, you'll get a free sample pack with any drink mix purchase. All right, back to the show. Our first caller is Tyler from Canada. What's up, Tyler? What's hey happening? Hey, guys. How's it going? Good, what man. Up? All right. Uh, super cool to be on the show, guys. This is uh, really cool. Never thought this would happen. <laughs> right on. <laughs> awesome. Uh, but uh, I'll get right into the question here. Uh, I'm a former high-level athlete with plenty of training experience. I love both the performance programs you guys have put out. Uh, I gravitate towards that style of training, uh, but enjoy programs like anabolic advanced and aesthetic as well. I still play sports, mainly hockey at a high level recreationally. And throughout the winter, I'm typically on the ice five to six days a week. In the summer, more like two to three days a week uh, and at somewhat lower intensity. Although the reality is I'm no longer a high level athlete. I feel I ask nearly the same demands for my body athletically as I used to. I'm curious as to what kind of yearly rotation of your programs you guys would recommend that would represent kind of a typical athlete cycle, postseason, off season, in season, that kind of thing. Great question, man. Yeah, How? Yeah. Um, uh, so I'm assuming you played uh, hockey for a lot of your life. Um, how, how, yeah. old, how old are you now? Uh, 29. Okay. So here's what's interesting about someone like you, right? The, the fact that you're playing so much hockey still at a high level, you're really getting a lot of the, or maintaining a lot of the athleticism through your practice and the games. Strength training at this point is going to be in one of two categories. Category one, uh, gaining more strength, more muscle, more speed. Category two, preventing injury. I would do the preventing injury when you're training the most uh, in hockey. And then when you do the least amount of hockey, that's when you can kind of focus on, on building if you want. But to be quite honest with you, a program like MAPS Performance and Performance Advanced, you never need to cycle out of those. Yeah. Those are the two, you know, of the few programs we have where you really don't need to come out of it ever because yeah. they, they hit everything. They're so balanced. They're so good with mobility, strength, all those things. It, it, it's not really necessary to move out of them. Yeah, to Sal's point, it's a sliding scale. So depending on like how you structure that for your off season, um, you put more emphasis on the the strength training and really kind of. Uh, highlight that fact so we can schedule two to three, you know, uh, foundational type workouts throughout the week that you can uh, do effectively. And then uh, in season, which I think that uh, we've, we've brought this up a few times, we even had Corey Schlesinger on the show to kind of, you know, reiterate this, but uh, like these micro workouts, like the 15 minute style uh, for in season training, it works fantastically. Uh, and, and that's just because, you, you know, we can keep that stimulus and basically maintain uh, the muscle and strength that you have. But now our, all our emphasis is on, um, you know, the, the actual sport and the skill. Uh, but yeah, like, you, again, toggling back and forth between performance and then, you know, I would say Mass 15 would be the only one I would add in there uh, for like the in-season type of training. Yeah, great. That's and, great. And off season, cool. an off season. Are you telling him that he should run three foundational days in season, either one foundational day or, or 15. fifteen minutes? Exactly. Yeah. So that would be kind of okay. your, your option. So in season, yeah. when it's winter time, you're only you're only training one day, one foundational day from performance uh, a week. That's it. The rest you're, or you're getting, yeah. or maps fifteen style. Be um, nice if we had a functional version of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah we yeah. got something coming down coming the pipe for you, Tyler. Don't worry. Be nice. Yeah, yeah. And then, oh, cool. And then, and then <laughs> all, yeah, and off season, just follow mass performance or mass performance advance. That's it. Right on. And you yeah. be set, man. Yeah, yeah. Those really take care of that. Bro. It's it's actually one of the few 
programs that we've and we've talked actually all, I don't know if we talked on air about that before or not but we've definitely talked off we air have. of like if there was a program that I would tell a client like you could run this indefinitely it would be that it would be that program because yeah. it, it addresses it doesn't uh, have any imba- yeah. it doesn't really create imbalance yeah, and you, like you may not go you may not be able to take that program and become a, a high level power lifter from it but you absolutely will keep yourself in great athletic it's super balanced yeah very very balanced cool that's awesome guys yeah you got it yeah. man Thanks, thanks for calling in, bro. Hey, wait, we didn't ask you if you have all those. Do you have Maps 15? I don't have Maps 15, oh, actually. Okay, oh. let, us, let us take care of you. My bad. We'll, we'll send that to you. We'll send Maps 15. Sweet. Wicked. Cool. Thanks yeah, very much, yeah. guys. Yeah, you got it. Great talking. Friend. All right, bro. Thank you, yeah. man. Yeah, that was easy. Hey, you know, at, at that, at that <laughs> right. level, like uh, you know, uh, a no. lot of the your, your sport is going to handle a lot of. The it's a great question you asked him. Yeah. I mean, that makes a huge difference at what part of his journey he's at. Uh, and when you're still in your 20s and you're still, even though you're not maybe not playing at the professional level, but this guy's playing five days a week in, you know, in the on season time. He said high level too. So yeah, yeah, it yeah, must yeah. be one of those rec leagues. Yeah, yeah. Like he, a bunch he's, of college yeah, he's not doing like league, yeah. newbie to hockey. No. He's playing at a, still at a very, and those things can get competitive. Let me tell you. <laughs> they can get, you got a lot of ex, like yeah, you have high a lot level of, college yeah, athletes. Yeah, you have ex pro and college athletes right. that are playing, right? Or the guy who just didn't make it, right? That's totally. in his mid 20s still. So he's getting plenty of great athletic training uh now it's to your point which i think is a way to look at it is i'm i'm either in the off season i'm trying to build a little bit of strength uh or in in season i'm really trying to protect myself That's right it. it's more like that instead of trying to throw the whole kitchen sink at it our next caller is christina from canada hi christina Hello. how can we help you hi good um just want to say thank you for everything you do um i am a new listener so i will introduce myself I am 39. I've been an athlete all my life, playing ice hockey since the age of five, and I continue to play. I have competed in 12 bikini competitions in the last 10 years. I have lupus, celiac, and just had a full hysterectomy to remove cancer last month. I am now cancer-free. I was always a cardio bunny and underate my protein. I was having digestive issues, so as of December 1st, 2023, I went full carnivore and made the decision to try and put on some muscle to move to the figure category. I sent in my question, which has now changed um, back in March. My question at the time was, I have been competing in bikini competitions, and I'm finding my feedback from the judges is I'm too lean. I want to move up to the figure category, which requires more muscle. I'm currently on the carnivore diet, as it has cured my autoimmune symptoms. How can I put on size and how should I change my training to go from bikini to figure? At the time, I was currently eating 200 to 250 grams of whole food protein and eating about 80 grams of fat. But since then, I started listening to you guys and it has helped me enormously. I dropped my protein intake to 130 to 150 grams and increased my fats to 100 to 120 grams. I started eating whole eggs instead of egg whites uh fattier fish regular ground beef instead of lean bacon and i added more sodium uh when lowering my protein i increased my fats and my calories went from 1800 to 2200 i completely cut out all my cardio and that consisted at the time uh spin biking five times a week for 60 minutes and i have noticed a huge change in muscle growth and strength i'm hitting new pr every week i now feel i can actually become a figure competitor my i have new questions though should i be taking extra creatine even if i'm on a carnivore diet and getting it naturally from all the meat i eat and i have noticed since going carnivore i need less sleep is this true you need less sleep when on the carnivore diet um if i'm lacking sleep on the carnivore diet should that be concerning to me or should i be prioritizing more sleep even though i feel well rested on an average of six hours of sleep at night. I currently lift six days a week, um, lifting, hitting every body part two times a week. Ah, great question. Yep. Okay, so uh, just some more questions. Yeah, have you had, and I'm sure you have because of your history, but uh, have you had somebody do gut testing with you to look for things like SIBO, CIFO, parasites, anything like that uh, before going car- carnival? No. Okay. No, I haven't. I've been on a two-year waiting list to see a specialist in Canada. The medical system isn't the fastest. Okay. Um, I, well, you can work. Can will you be open to working with a functional medicine practitioner privately? Uh, no. 
Okay. All right. And that kids, because what I would say is there, there are definitely cases where the carnivore diet seems to be ideal. And in those cases that I've worked with or seen, uh, these are individuals who we, we just mysterious. We can't figure out what's going on. Now, oftentimes, many of the issues that people have autoimmune uh, stem from the gut and they're, they're undiagnosed issues like parasites, SIBO, or SIFO. So that could be bacterial overgrowth or fungal overgrowth. When those are treated, the symptoms go away and then the person can then eat a more balanced diet. Um, so that would be what you'd be looking at. And if you were open to working with, we have a forum, by the way, that's free. So you don't have to pay for it. And you might be able to ask questions there and maybe help yourself. It's, uh, which one is, the, which one's for uh, MP Holistic MP Health. Holistic Health. There you go. MP Holistic Health.com. So I go there. Now, no, no, it's a, it's on I'm Facebook. I'm sorry. MP Holistic Health on Facebook. Sorry. It's a, it's a free group. You can join. There's functional medicine practitioners on there and you can ask questions and all that. All right. So I have questions still. Yep. Uh, I just, I'm curious, uh, why, why all the shows? What's, uh, what's with the competing? Um, I just love it. It's, I'm not trying to go pro or anything. It's just a hobby. I like, it keeps me grounded, keeps me in a routine. Um, it's easy for me to stay lean. Um, so yeah, it's just a hobby. Okay. And then what, uh, one more question. Why wouldn't you want to work with a functional medicine practitioner? Um, I'm just on a waiting list to try and get with one. Okay. All right. So you, privately, you just don't want to, it's the out of pocket issues that that would be the reason why you wouldn't work with someone privately. Yes. Okay. All right. Um, as far as the diet is concerned and sleep, uh, no, that's not a typical reaction or response to changing to another diet. I unless, mean, unless it, it was, she was eating something that was bothering her before. Well, she got six eliminated. hours a night is very rare. Super rare. It was like something like less than 0.1% of the population are, I can't remember the label, uh, are individuals who need, uh, closer to six or seven hours rather than eight. Um, but if you were sleeping more before, less now, I mean, you feel well rested. It's hard to say. Could be hypomanic. Do you have symptoms? Uh, like, do you get into these dopamine states where you're like impulsive and energized and I'm doing everything? I'm hyper motivated. And is that sometimes followed by periods of I'm really tired? Don't feel so motivated. Is that resonate at all with you or, you, or, or does this just feel totally normal? Totally normal. Like, I feel like, for instance, I don't drink coffee, I have no caffeine. When I wake up in the morning, I take a cold shower. That's why I wake up. Okay. Um, gosh, like I have, that's the thing is I'm getting six hours of sleep average. If I get seven, I have a good night, but I don't feel tired and I feel well rested. If you feel good and you feel well rested and you're not getting any energy crashes or any symptoms of lack of sleep, then I, I would, you know, I would say you're probably okay. I think you're going to be okay. okay. Um, and then did you have any, that was, were there more to the question? I can't remember. I mean, I have more questions still too. Like, so what, like, give me an idea of like your, like, I know you're asking some questions about the protein and stuff like that too, but what's like your overall arching goal of like for yourself? Is it more health related? Is it more performance related? Is it more about aesthetics and looking a certain way? Like what, like what, what's the main goal? Uh, to look a certain way. I want to put more muscle on so I can compete and figure. Okay. Yeah, I mean, at this point, it would just be bumping your calories, and you're eat, you're eating enough protein for someone. How, how much do you weigh? Uh, hundred and twenty six. Yeah, your, your protein intake's fine. So the way that you would increase calories, and you are very limited with what you can eat. I would eat things that fit within that uh, within that context that is more palatable, because you're probably running into satiety. Um, that kind of a diet can be very hard to push calories because you just feel so full. So I would look at foods that uh, are a little bit more palatable that fit within that context. And that's pretty much it. Avoiding the cardio is a good idea. Um, yeah, focus that's on, all good stuff. That focusing on getting change. stronger in the gym, not overtraining, great idea. Um, it, it, that, so you're doing everything else right. It's just now a, a, a matter of being able to eat more calories, which can be hard on a carnivore diet because it really very crushes hard. your appetite. It's very hard to do it on that. I mean, wow. the move might be, and this is obviously where a, a functional practitioner would, would help, right, if you did some testing. so we could, Because I'm assuming that there was probably something that you were eating uh, when you were eating a different diet that was causing issues, and then you going carnivore has eliminated that. But it doesn't necessarily mean that like all carbs are bad for you. I mean, you could probably there's probably some carb carbohydrates like have you, fruit. Have you experimented with honey yeah, and fruit? Anything? Yes, and it just goes right through me. Okay, mm, all right. Okay. In that okay. case, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. Stay the course, That's and uh, like, like I said, I know of people who they do all the testing, and everything comes back: no parasite, no bacterial over overgrowth, no fungal overgrowth. We don't know what's going on. 
and the and their body is like yours hyper reactive uh, to different foods, and so eliminating them seems to be the only relief. Uh, in which case, stay the course. Um, it, really, it's just a matter of bumping calories, and you're going to have to find stick with foods that are more palatable, foods that you can eat more of, in order to hit those more calories. Because it, it's tough when you're eating a lot of when it's when you're carnivore based, mm -hmm. it's really hard to eat a lot of calories. It was the most difficult thing. So you've just been listening for a short period of time, but uh, when I was competing. Uh, was the time when I we went carnivore. We we dabbled in or the ketogenic diet, and I was reporting back to the guys the hardest part about this. I loved how I felt, same way like you. Like I saw all these great benefits. Like I have autoimmune, right? So I have psoriasis. I noticed it tamped that all down. So the way I felt health wise uh, was really really good. What I what I had a really hard time with was actually building muscle on it because it's just hard to consume that much uh, meat and calories through only eating meat. So that was my exact uh, my my exact struggle, and it was right around the same time I was competing, and so it's a really tough thing, which is why I kept asking questions about you know what is the main goal? Like, are, do we have to compete? <laughs> like, if you're trying to compete and doing that is it's it's tough, man. It really is. How and, many days a week do you do you lift weights? Uh, six days a week. You know, you might actually gain muscle by bringing that down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, running like an animal. Yeah, so a week off and. Because I was out camping, came back, and my lifts were through the roof. Oh, oh yeah. yeah, you're overtrained. Yeah, that's your that's sign. A huge indication. Yeah, you you drop your training volume way down, and you'll probably you'll probably gain muscle as a result. Have you followed like a basic full body three day a week routine? No, I just been doing just kind of your basic bodybuilder oh, routine. I, and I would love to see you on anabolic. Yep, I would love to see you on anabolic. Oh yeah, you you're probably going to gain muscle if you got stronger from taking a week off. That's one hundred percent means you're you're doing more. Then it's not only more than it's necessary, uh, but you're probably preventing yourself from progressing. And I'll also mention um, food allergies, friends in my family. My mom, my sisters, we all, and my brother, we all have celiac. So mm -hmm. it is a genetic. Yeah. No, I mean, like I said, there's definitely situations where we just don't know what the hell's going on. And the least reactive foods typically are meat. Typically tends to be the case. So um, I, I would cut down the volume of training for 100%, sure. 100%. Yeah. I mean, look, at you already saw lots of positive things from some of the adjustments that you made from listening to us yeah. with uh, the cardio and things like that. Like if you trust us, that would be if you're a client and this is what you're telling me, this would yeah. be the, the next Especially move. Especially trying to build right now, like mm -hmm. getting that added bit of recovery is going to do wonders. I, I, what's, what's awesome is you have such a great, you have a great physique already. You've been lifting for a really long time. Um, you, you'd be surprised how little of volume you need to, to progress. And really what you just need to do is be able to be in a caloric surplus. We're challenged by what we can eat. And so the move would be to scale back to volume. And I think you're going to see a, a positive. If you get stronger consistently, you will build muscle. It's just hundred percent how it works. So at this point, the goal should be to get stronger. So, you know, either a full body three day week routine like maps anabolic or maps anabolic advanced, or even a powerlifting based routine where the goal is just to get strong like maps powerlift. And I bet following that, you'll probably see yourself gain some nice lean body mass as a result. Well, let's start with anabolic. Let's send her anabolic. We'll send you MAPS anabolic. Do the, the three-day week version with the trigger sessions. And if you're getting stronger week in and week out, it's working. You're, you're moving in the right direction. And one more thing. So should I would I benefit from taking a creatine supplement right. even though a ton of natural creatine from the meat I'm eating? You know, uh, from a muscle gain perspective, Splitting hairs. probably not. However, there's interesting studies that show cognitive benefit from uh, higher doses of creatine. I don't think it would hurt. I don't think it would hurt to try, and you would know, take five grams a day, and then within a couple weeks, see if you notice a difference. If you don't, probably a waste of time. I wouldn't worry too much about Al it. Although I will say this, because you're so reactive, be very careful with right. what you take. It's just... Mm. Let's be honest, bro. Even if she gets a little bit of benefit from it, it's not enough to make a difference on your physique. She's eating so much meat. Yeah, yeah. You're 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 so high on on protein already. How many pounds of 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 red meat are you eating a day? Um, I'm eating about two eight ounce steaks a day. Tons of regular beef. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You're, you're probably ta you're topping out you're with fine. protein. And even if she wasn't, again, it's not. You're as a competitor. Yeah. Like we're are you're 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 judging your physique. You're not yeah. going to see a difference in a no. a program ran all with with creatine and one without it. It's yeah. not worth it. No. Save your money. It's like it's not a big deal. So. Uh, you're doing a lot of the right things already. My, some totally. of this, by the way, too, might just be giving us a little bit of time. Like, how long has it been since you've cut back on the cardio and done some of those things? Has, has it been very long? 
Well, it's been, I had to take time off because just uh, last month I had to get a full hysterectomy. So I'm back mm-hmm. to lifting back to, and I got back to lifting a couple of weeks after and um, my strength has increased way more just two weeks after getting a surgery you than were, before the surgery. Oh, Christina, yeah. you were so overtrained. Yeah, you, and you might just, you know what? Just this is time. Dude, you're, Maps you're doing, anabolic. Yeah, you're doing the right things now. Maps anabolic, I think getting you shifted over to that and then just just uh, give us some time like this. I think your body's going to respond you're gonna, positively. You're going to gain a lot of muscle. If that's the case, if coming two weeks after surgery, you were stronger, you were really overtrained. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Check, <laughs> check back check back in with us too. I'd love to hear an update yeah, back from it. you in like 30 days or so just to see how things are going. Okay, we'll do. Thank uh, you. All right, I got it. Already. Thank you. Thank you. That sucks I, that she has to wait two years. I have a like really that. hard time answering questions like this when it's like we have all these health things that we're trying yeah, you shouldn't to compete. Yeah, you just and and then and then you know, my job is to to you it's your goal, it's your body, right? So if you tell me and she was very straight up, I don't care about how I look. Yeah. That's what I'm trying to do. And I like competing. So it's like, okay. If as, it brings her joy. Yeah. So I'm not yeah. gonna I'm not gonna argue or wrestle with someone like that. But when I hear things like i we have all these autoimmune issues and we've got this stuff that we're trying to yeah. solve that's related to health sports yeah. are not healthy for the body no and i don't have times i have to say that <laughs> any sport is not healthy for the body and i know people get all up in arms about that but it's like it's the truth anything at that high of a level whether it's playing football and crashing into people or it's dieting extremely uh, for long periods of time to get on stage and present yourself at an unhealthy now, body recreational weight. Recreational fun stuff, good for you. Right. Training it's, to compete at a high at level. At a high level. No, it's it's not, all about performance. It's not healthy for the body. No. And so you're you're juggling this, like I'm trying to f- solve health issues and be a healthier person while I'm simultaneously doing something that is unhealthy yeah. for my body. Yep. And hey, there's nothing wrong with that. There's yep. For periods of time, if you want to do that, you're an athlete. Like I'm yep. not shaming anybody for that, but I'm always challenged with when I get questions related to this and I'm, I'm hearing, I'm trying to yeah. become healthier. I want to be healthier with these it's things. It's like plugging holes in a ship. Yeah. yeah it's and, like, and it's like, the truth is like, if you let me do whatever I wanted to do with you as a client and guide you, I would say, Hey, let's just stop competing for a little bit and let's really try and solve this, the, all these health issues that we're dealing with. And guess what? You're probably going to look pretty awesome by the way, while we do this, but you're not going to have this pressure of in six weeks, I got to get on stage and look a certain way and having to put that stress on the body. And so always challenged, uh, when you get a caller like this, because I don't have the time to build the relationship with the client, to build the trust, to then convince them that, hey, let's let's maybe take a break for a while and go this direction, and let me see what I can show you. Like, I have a hard time with that. This month's sale, Maps Bands and Maps 40 Plus, both 50% off. If you are interested, click on the link at the top of the description below, or you can go to mapsfitnessproducts.com and use the code AUGUST50 for the discount. All right, here comes the show. Our next caller is Sylvia from Kansas. Hi, Sylvia. Hi. How can we help you? Hi, guys. How you doing? Hi. Um, so I'll just start start off here. Um, I'm 33 years old, 5'5", five, five, um, about 182 pounds. Um, I have been using semaglutide. I'm on week nine. Um, and I have seen good progress. I've lost 12 pounds so far. Um, I am in phase two of MAPS Muscle Mommy and absolutely love it. Um, but I'm wondering if it's too much volume for me while using semaglutide. Um, I don't track my calories because it's one of the habits I'm trying to break. Um, I just have found that I'm so fixated on finishing what I've measured out, um, but anyways, sorry, my question arises from about a month ago. Um, I sit at my desk for eight hours for work, um, but I religiously go to the gym to lift three times a week. Um, and so I'm also getting about 9,000 to 12,000 steps a day through walks and daily life. Um, about a month ago, when I first started phase two. Um, I caught a summer cold, so I didn't go to the gym for a couple of weeks. But during this time, I saw a massive decrease in in my weight. And so I'm wondering if maybe muscle mommy is just too much activity for me at this time. Um, It's just looking for your guys's 
opinion on that. How do you feel? Tell me how you feel. I mean, overall, I feel a lot better. Um, I used to have back pain, um, which I don't anymore. Um, I kind of, I get about seven hours of sleep a night, but I still kind of feel tired during the day. Are you, are you getting stronger in the program? Um, that's the other thing. Actually, I've, I've noticed that I've been decreasing in yeah. weight a little bit, maybe about like five pounds. Hmm. So, you know, it's, this is, this is a great question because, uh, you're on a GLP one and, uh, for people listening right now, like when you drop your calories, which that's what GLP ones do. They tend to make you eat less. The amount of volume you can handle decreases as well. Yep. Muscle mommy is a very appropriate program for most people. But if you're in a really big calorie deficit or your calories are just low, it may be too much volume. It might just be too much volume in that context. Yep. I think a program like maps 15, the advanced version of it, I think would be probably more ideal for someone like you. Um, during the stage, during what you're doing. Because if you're not getting stronger, that also tells me it might be too much in combination, especially with you saying you're getting a little tired. And sleep. And, you know, and sleep. So I would go, I would go, Matt, do you have MAPS 15? I don't, no. All right, we'll send that to you. I think that would probably be more appropriate mm -hmm. considering what you're doing at the moment. And then if you start to get stronger in the program, you know you made the right, it was the right decision. Mm-hmm. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I wasn't with the strength portion. I wasn't for sure. Um, you know, with being in a calorie deficit, you guys have mentioned before that that's kind of normal, but it is, um, it is, but you know, I'll follow up with this then. Were you lifting weights before you followed maps, uh, muscle mommy on a consistent basis? Yes. What were you doing before? Yep. Um, so I rotate between anabolic performance Okay. Some, some strength loss can happen with a calorie deficit, but I think considering the context of now that we have some experience with GLP ones and what they can do with calories, yeah. uh, it's, it's a mm -hmm. lot easier to do too much. You just have less coming I mean, in. do you feel like, cause I've, we've, I've had a lot of family and friends now and a lot more experience with the GLP ones mm -hmm. in, the, in the last six months. Are you, um, does it feel like you're eating a lot less or does it just feel like you're eating a little less? How does it feel to you? Uh, in comparison to what you were before? Um, a lot less, honestly. Okay. There it's, you go. Yep. That's it. That's all I need to hear. Yeah. That's, okay. that's, that's enough, yeah, that's enough to know right there that it's, it, it's because some people, I have some clients that were, are running GLP ones and they're like, yeah, I've noticed my cravings a little bit down, but I'm not, I'm still eating a lot. I still feel fine. I'm still eating, finish my meal. Like, but when I took it, it like crushed my appetite. I was yeah. eating half the food uh, than I was eating before. So, and I could mm -hmm. totally feel a dramatic difference in my energy. I had to scale back my my training intensity and volume. Yeah. And so if you can tell, even though you're not even tracking, you can tell that you're eating significantly less than what yeah. you were for, then 100% yeah. it's too much. Hydration is yep. also a big, big component to that too. Right. So just making sure, I don't know how you've been tracking with that, but making sure, yeah, you're, you're good and hydrated. Sodium. If you're not taking element, you should have element. Use use element. Drink a lot of water uh, and run maps fifteen. Should see a positive effect from those things right there in itself. Okay, perfect. I'll definitely um, start on maps fifteen. You said the advanced ver version. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. can do the advanced version. We'll send that to you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, guys. All right, Thank you, Sylvia. Sylvia. Bye. We're gonna get we get more we're gonna get more and more of these types of questions. Uh, oh, yeah. But you know, one of the biggest mistakes people make when they go on a in a diet, GLP one or not, is they drop their calories and then simultaneously increase their activity. Yeah, yeah. that's a bad combination. Oh yeah, you, you reduce your calories, you have you're, you're not as able. Deprive yourself of energy and that's uh, right. Yeah, just destined for especially long. when it's it's a significant. If it's enough that you really know, I mean, that was yeah. what I was looking I know, for. I know that was the right question because I, I I definitely have had now too though some some clients and family and friends that are taking GLP ones and they they're like oh yeah no I'm it's I'm eating slight yeah they're species, like I'm yeah. eating about the yeah. same I'm not really uh, so okay someone like that maybe I'm not too concerned right. but if you're like oh no I'm eating a lot less and yep. it's like a quick answer uh -huh. that you know you're because you're probably missing a whole other meal or half the calories you're eating yep. it's like that's account a for it. yeah that's okay. a quick you don't need very much uh, intensity and volume in strength training right now because you're so low calorie our next caller is Sharon from England hi Sharon how can we help you 
Hello, hello. Hi, guys. Thank you for having me. This is an absolute privilege. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. How can we help you? Um, okay. So um, I'm going to say a little bit about myself, first of all. I'm 52. I've been um, strength training for about two years. Um, absolutely love it. Really committed. And um, at the moment, I'm doing your anabolic. Um, and I'm on phase three. It's all going really well. Um, the, the only thing is, it's not to do with like that program. It's just a general thing because I've been doing it for two years. I don't feel that. Well, I've got I've got definition on my arms. Love that. And I, I feel much like much firmer, but I just don't seem to have that definition on my legs. And I'm just wondering, you know, is it my age? Am I not am I not doing strength training heavy enough or am I just like wanting too much too soon? I just was hoping that you could guide me in the right direction or just tell me what I need to be doing. Tell me, tell me a little bit more about uh, the last kind of two years, your journey nutritionally. Like what have you done? Uh, have you been on like a maintenance? Do you, have you ran cuts? Do you eat a calorie surplus? Like what does the dieting look like for the last two years and currently? Yeah. So I was 59 kilos and then when I started strength training, it went up to 52, 51, and that's generally where I am at the moment. Um, I think I've got quite a good diet. I do watch my protein. I'm probably having about 80 grams, I'd say, of protein a day. Um, I'm not really dieting as such because I just kind of, you know, I, know, I sort of, I average about 1500 calories. So, and that just seems to keep me ticking over. I'm not really, you know, overly hungry or anything like that. So that helps. That helps me a lot, actually. So I, I think what you would benefit from is a, going in, a, in an intentional surplus and really, and you also asked the question too, like, am I not lifting enough weight? Um, do you, do you feel like you could probably push yourself more strength wise or do you, do you find yourself not adding weight to the bar when maybe you can, like, cause that would be an area where I'd want to push you is really push, uh, getting strong in your legs, squatting, deadlifting heavy and, and, and intentionally being in a calorie surplus for a period of time, not a massive one. If you say you eat around 1500, you feel good. I might try and stretch you to 1800 to 2000 range and really try and, you know, push weight while we're lifting, uh, on your legs and build, some muscle and and focus on building uh, quite a bit of muscle down there. And then after we've done that for a period of time, I would go the other do other way and lean you out so I could reveal uh, the muscle that we've built on your legs. That would be a good idea because what might be happening right now if you're just kind of hovering around these calories is uh, you're doing enough to add a little bit of muscle, but then you also are low enough that you start to lose a little bit and you're kind of staying healthy and you look you look really healthy and fit, so doing good there. But if you want more, like I want to build more, I want my legs to look more shapely, more muscular, uh, then we need to be intent, uh, have an intent to build and grow the legs and build muscle there. And that might be by us increasing calories uh, intentionally for a period of time while also pushing the weight on your legs. Sharon, do you do you know how many grams of fat and carbs, you, carbohydrates you eat? Do you avoid either of those or is it pretty balanced? Um, I really try to eat fats like lots of salmon and omega. I okay. sort of, but I, I do try to steer clear. Of, well, I, I do have a bit of carb, but you know, I, I don't steer clear of bread or anything like that. But I probably like to have more. Um, healthy fats and okay. like proteins, really. If you if you added about forty grams of protein to your diet, maybe another ten, maybe fifteen grams of fat, I think that would give you the extra calories that you need to fuel the muscle. Another another forty grams of protein to the eighty. Yeah, is that what you're saying? Yeah, yes, yeah. I yes. would go. I would. I would add another thirty to forty, and another ten to twenty grams of fat. That'll give you the extra calories that you need. If you if you want, you can instead of the fat, you could add 30, 40 grams of carbs. I don't think it's gonna make a difference. Um, yeah. and, and that'll give you the, and so here's, what's going to happen. You're going to build muscle. And if you're, if you're strong, getting stronger and building muscle, you're not going to gain, you're probably not going to gain body fat. And so then you end up becoming leaner as a side effect because yeah. you're now leaner as a body, as a percentage of your body weight. Right. So if I, in other words, if I gave you five more pounds of muscle, but you gain no additional fat, you're actually leaner and you'll see more definition because it's, it's about body fat percentage, right? It's a percentage of your body weight, not necessarily the total amount of fat that's on your body. And then the, the other result of that is a faster metabolism. 
it'll be much easier yeah. for you to get a little leaner, which you look like you're pretty lean now, especially with your body weight and, and seeing you on camera. You're looking like you're pretty lean now, but based off your calories and all that, I think Adam's on point. If, if we try to build, I think you're going to get better results than if we try to cut. I don't. I wouldn't want to cut no. at 1,500 calories. That's not, that's not a good idea. Definitely not. And to, to, even, to simplify even more what Sal said, uh, just look at your current diet without changing a lot. Look at your current diet and just uh, every time you eat meat, uh, have an extra ounce to two ounces than you normally would. And there it is. So there it is. That'll do it. That'll take care of the fat and they'll take care of the protein. So whatever. And just, yeah, sorry. And just do that for what, what a set period of time or just do that? In, indefinitely for yeah. now. Yeah, keep yeah. going. Yeah, yeah. Just you You need more, your body needs more calories and it, it, it would definitely benefit from a little bit more protein. It's an easy way to bump the calories organically without trying to get all complicated or add a shake or anything like that. You could use it through a shake if, if you like doing that, but a much easier way would be just look at your meals that you eat a day. And instead of like, if you consistently kind of eat six ounces of meat, make it eight ounces going forward. And that's a, that's a, and that's a, a small enough of an increase that you're not going to put on a bunch of body fat. What you're going to do is you're going to put on some muscle and you're going to feel stronger. You're just going to get stronger. And, and, and yeah. the result will be your metabolism will get faster, like Sal is saying. And so, but that, that's what we need to do at this point. Like I said, it, you, you look to me like you're pretty healthy. And I think that's a result of having a healthy diet, being consistent with training, and, and you look healthy and fit. But when a client comes to me and say, okay, I want more, Adam. I want, like, let's go build these legs. I want them to look more muscular and shapely. Okay, I got you, but this is what we need to do. Now it's time to increase these calories and get this get more protein, and let's go hit the weights hard for a while. I agree, I agree with all that uh, advice. I, I'm curious, like, do you have any issues in terms of connecting with muscles in your legs, or, or is that something that – you know, you, you are feeling that and you're getting good uh, feedback, at least from that. Yeah, I, I do feel I get quite good feedback. Um, actually, I was going to be a little bit cheeky and maybe add a little second question, but it is connected. So I'm hoping that's OK. That's fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Go for it. Go for it. We like cheeky. <laughs> <laughs> and basically, um, you know, we, you spoke about adding more weight, which is what I, I'd, I'd love to do, especially with the squats. But I, I do struggle a bit with my form and I've been practicing quite a bit and I've been doing the mobility. Um, but the, con the connection that I have or the difficulty is when I sometimes go to squat, I sort of feel a bit of a pain. Not, It's not actually a, a massive pain, but I can feel it on my right leg, my inner thigh. And so if I try to add more weight, uh, it, it just, I can't really squat. I can't really add much more weight. And then at the moment, I'm not right. Not, not right now. Yeah. yeah, yeah, no, not right now. But if you bump the calories, you'll go work out and you'll notice, oh, I'm stronger. Yeah. And you'll be able to add yeah. weight to the bar. Yeah, yeah. That, that'll be it right there. I wouldn't mind giving you, uh, because you bring that up right now, uh, a program that will you'll benefit from is Symmetry. So we'll give you that program so you have that in your arsenal, but we don't necessarily need to go to that right away. Um, although, I'm, although you could follow map symmetry with the extra calories, and, still gain. and that'll do yeah. everything. Yeah. Why don't we do that? You'll, Why don't, you'll build. I you're already say. in phase three of anabolic, which means you're almost done. Why not follow it up with map symmetry, increase your protein by about thirty to forty grams, add another 10, 15 grams of fat, and then you're set. Mm -hmm. Oh wow, wicked! Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I would say what you're telling me is, is I can get the legs that I want. I can get yes. that definition. Yes, yes you can. Yes, you yeah. can. Just remember this, like, and, and this is actually very common. I've had many clients in this exact same situation, and the the your your body when we when we go in the gym and we lift, we send a signal for the body to build muscle. That's only the first part of it. The next piece of that is that the nutrition that we eat, yeah. the protein, the calories, there has to be enough to go there to go build the muscle. Otherwise, all we're kind of doing is kind of burning. We're staying healthy. We're staying fit. We're stimulating the muscle. We're keeping it. We're not building because we're not getting enough. We're not getting enough of the nutrients and calories needed to build the muscle. So we need to increase that so that when you go put that hard work in in the gym and you totally. and you and you train hard and you send that signal like it, you're doing already, then you, the body has the nutrients to go the building blocks to go add the muscle and that's where we're at right now we're just in an area where you're not quite enough and so you're you're doing a good job of staying healthy and maintaining your physique but you want to progress and if we want to progress we need to increase those calories that's right yeah. okay amazing thank you so much thank you thank yes you for right. calling in sharon i would love to hear back from you after you've been doing symmetry for a couple months reach back out to us yeah, definitely. Thank you. Really appreciate it. And love the podcast. You guys have like taught me so much. It's been amazing. Thank awesome. You. Thank, Thank you for the so support. Much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.
I always wish I had an English accent. I know, it sounds so much cooler. It just makes you sound way better. <laughs> Everything is cool. My wife's family is from England, so every time I hear them talk, I'm like, oh, you know how cool that would be if I said <laughs> an English accent? People now, take you more seriously. You know, a lot of, <laughs> thanks, Justin. Yeah. A lot of um, this is this is the this is the answer for a lot of women, especially mm -hmm. women. Super common. And I'm gonna I'm gonna stereotype here, but especially women uh, from our generation, because we were hammered, especially when we were hammered. Eat little, eat little. Don't eat this. Don't eat that. Oh, so they're yeah. afraid. So 1,500 calories it is really hard to build muscle and strength on 1,500 calories. I don't care who you are. So, so that little so extra common. bump, yeah, yeah. She, as soon as she bumps it, she's going to notice. Within the week, she's going to be like, oh my God, I'm, I'm stronger. It's also a very hard thing for uh, both men and women to juggle that when you have a goal of you want to be a little bit leaner and you want to maybe even lose a few pounds, but then you also want to yeah. have muscle in a certain yeah. area. Yeah. Definition. Yeah, very, very difficult to do. Yeah, the, 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 the definition of getting definition is building muscle. Right. And if you are in a calorie deficit um, a majority of the time or all the time, you're just not going to build muscle. Oh. You may be able to hold on to it, sustain it, and cut what I think is happening to her because she's not really cutting, she's not really bulking, she's kind of eating where she's satisfied. So she's getting enough calories to kind of sustain the muscle and she's stimulating enough to sustain what she has, but she's asking to progress. And if you want to progress, build more muscle, she's got to increase those calories to give the, the body uh, the, the nutrients to go and the building blocks to go, to go uh, build that muscle.